Some of you don't know because you haven't lived as long, but things have changed in America. Some of you as as teenagers, and this is not a, a negative at all, please, please hear me out. We are living in times that some of our older generation are shaking their heads going, what in the world is going on? And the younger generation is saying, wow, this is cool. Look what I can say now and not get in trouble. Look what I can do and not get in trouble. We are living in times where things, not just technologically, but socially, ethically, spiritually, are being paraded in front of us like a buffet line. And some people are, being con- are, are convinced that as, if it's there and it's not hurting anybody, it must be okay. Some people have the idea that, well, if you know, life's short, you've got to try everything at least once. And I'm here to tell you that there are some things you try it once and you're done. Is that really a good way to view our world today? I was reminded just the other day, you know how as a parent you teach your kids things and then when you don't quite live up to them, they remind you what you taught them. Ever had that happen? (laughs) The other day I was driving my truck. Notice I said truck because it was the big one. And there was a snowbank. And I just had to conquer that snowbank. <laughs> to which my daughter replied, just because you can doesn't mean you should. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's good wisdom, right? <laughs> I think that's probably a better way to view life in this day where so much stuff is available. I mean, information is, is abounding. Uh, inventions are abounding connections are abounding. I mean, there's all kinds of things out here that are just waiting for you to give your time, your energy, your talents, your money, everything to take advantage of it. But just because you should or you can doesn't mean you should. I want to take a moment to thank my wife and Dan for helping me this year in our first fruits. A really blessed time. Different than other first fruits, but a blessed time of just being able to settle in the first part of this year. They both did a great job, and last week my wife did a, did a super job kind of wrapping the whole thing up with, this year is going to be a story, just like last year was a story. And the year before was a story, or, or maybe a chapter in the life of your book. 2017 is going to be a, another chapter in your life, and it's going to matter what you write, what others write, and what God writes in your book. And as I began to wait on the Lord, several different things came to mind, and I... told my wife as the week was winding down I'm not sure which way to go that can be dangerous for a preacher in case you don't know because I could stand up here and talk about a lot of things for a long time that I'm very passionate about but in light of what we have done for the first seven weeks of the year committing our time energy resources to focusing on Jesus and endeavoring to do just what Jesus did. The question kept coming back to my mind, what now? Now that I know all these things and now that I am reminded that this year is going to be another story and I can't change the chapters of the past, but I can definitely let God write my story in a brand new way that speaks of redemption and grace and power and majesty and freedom and glory. 
What now? The disciples asked that same question in Matthew chapter 24. Jesus, the chapter starts out with Jesus taking them to a point where they're in the, ta- in the temple, right by the temple, and he looks at this grand structure, and he says, guys, you see those wonderful stones? You see this wonderful building? They said, oh, yeah. They said, isn't this great? This is our landmark. This is what Israel really stands out for is this temple. He said, not one stone is going to be left on another. Now, you've got you to grasp this because it's almost as if he was identifying a national monument and telling his disciples that the thing that they were banking on, the thing that they had a lot of confidence in, was going to absolutely be destroyed. And when the things we put a lot of confidence in end up failing... We often ask the question, now what? So in verse 3, it picks up. He says, now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming at the end of the age? Jesus answered. In verse 4, he says, take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. The very first thing Jesus said is, you have got to be aware that opportunities to be deceived abound when the things we trusted in begin to crumble. Insecurity has a way of exposing vulnerabilities in the human life. Oftentimes, if somebody is attacking you, And you're like, man, where'd that come from? If you will weave and and, and wade through all the stuff that's gone on that person's life, at the bottom of it could very well be insecurity. And Jesus says, when the temple is destroyed, not one stone left upon another, you are no longer the nation of the temple. Be aware. Deception is knocking on the door. He specifically says deception about the Christ. In other words, deception about a solution, a savior. When we find ourselves insecure, we are vulnerable to try a lot of different things, hoping that we can get back to where we used to be. When the disciples were challenged about deception, Jesus said in verse 5 that many will be deceived. In other words, it works. That's why people keep lying. That's why people keep thinking up schemes. The Ponzi schemes, the 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 uh, shams, and the the telephone calls that people are 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 putting out, and people give their information because they're guaranteed return. When we're insecure, we will be vulnerable to deception, and when deception knocks on the door, it can look really good. It can say the right things. It can do the right things. But ultimately, we need to realize for us as Bible-believing Christians, there is no other Savior. And if you don't know Jesus now, you better get on the, 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 the road that helps you understand exactly who it is. Because Jesus said... In that day, when your confidence in the spiritual stuff around you is absolutely gone, there will be people who will come along and say, follow me. There will be people who will come along and say, look at what I can do for you. And when that happens, Jesus said, many will follow
Verse 6, he says, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled. Isn't that interesting? Jesus said, when people are walking around telling you they're Jesus. And I remember several years ago, some guy down in Florida actually changed his name to Jesus Christ. And people followed him. Yeah. Now, the idea that people will follow people is, is not new. The idea that somebody can be real charismatic and somebody can be real convincing or somebody can pay people to follow them, that's not new. But what is happening in our day, and we're seeing it more and more, because of the instability in our world, people are saying, now what? And when somebody steps into that insecurity and broken down world, pretty soon it sounds like, i got to try this. And then you throw the name Jesus Christ on it. And people with some education in who Jesus is, but not really understanding what he is or who he really is, will find themselves led astray. That means you better know the truth. In the world of currency, it has been told many times and that when, you, when they train people to identify counterfeit money, they don't take them to classes on counterfeit money. They have them handle the truth so much, so often, that when the counterfeit comes along, they don't have to know everything about it. They just know something doesn't feel right. Oh, I would to God that all of us would be so familiar with Jesus. We would be so familiar with His Word that when somebody comes along, regardless of what they look like, regardless of the signs and wonders, regardless of their voice, regardless of their knowledge, we would deep down inside say, something's not quite matching. Not because you know the doctrine of demons, not because you know the encyclopedia of religions, but because you know Jesus. And if it's not Jesus doesn't feel right, doesn't have the same fruit, it doesn't have the same results, it doesn't have the same peace that passes understanding. Listen, we got to get past feelings. We've got to get to the point where we know that we know that we know. Because now what often opens the door to a lot of different things. Verse 7, he says, nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilence, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Remember what he said? But don't worry about it. Now, I don't know about you. Some of you heard what I read. Some of you, like, got lost. But did you hear? Pestilence. Earthquakes. Famines, wars. You know what our response should be when we hear that? Yeah, I knew that. Well, aren't you going to get excited about it? No. Aren't you going to protest? No. Aren't you going to get a a petition? No. Well, we got to do something. Yeah, we really do need to do something. How about let's pray? You get it? Now what leaves us with this opportunity to trust ourselves more than trust God? Now what leaves us vulnerable to a lot of different things? And if we are not settled and foundationally solid on the Lord Jesus Christ, we will be swept with every wind of doctrine that flies through. God has blessed me with a face that seems to be recognizable over the years. Somebody from 2000 showed up at church the other day and said, I know you. You look familiar. Last way I remember him was 3B Detention Center. I hope that when you hear about Jesus... He sounds familiar. Verse 9, he says, Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. 
And then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. Verse 13 of chapter 20 says, But he who endures to the end shall be saved. Don't need to pack your parachute, folks. No need for an escape hatch. A plan B. Trust in the Lord and he will see you through. And Jesus said, just like earlier he said, don't be worried, don't be troubled. He says in this verse, verse 12, he says, um, or verse 13, he who endures to the end shall be saved. Not the one who escapes tribulation. The one who endures to the end. What Jesus was describing to his disciples was a time of trouble, time of turmoil, time of insecurity. And it reminds me in the letter to Timothy, a young man who was endeavoring to carry on the gospel and the good news of Jesus Christ. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Paul writes to him in Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3, and he says, But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves. We got any of that going on today? Just a little bit. Lovers of money. Boasters. Proud. Blasphemers. Disobedient to parents. The teenagers just woke up, right? It's out there. However, let me be very fair to the teenagers here that did not say teenagers disobedient to parents. It just said disobedient to parents. Unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving. Matter of fact, Troy, can you... Can you put that up there just so that these people don't think I'm just adding, throwing words in here? I know most of you don't think I'm throwing words in, but sometimes it just really helps to see what's going on. 2 Timothy chapter 3 lays some things out that in Timothy's day were happening. And we are so much wiser today. We're so much more advanced But isn't it funny how we're doing some of the same things? We just look good in Nike. We just look good with all those bright colors. We're doing some of the same thing. And so when 2 Timothy chapter 3, 1 through 4 lays out a description, I think we need to pay attention Verse 2, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. Verse 3 goes on, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And go back to verse 4. If this is not a description of some of the same conditions we are living in today, then I'm not in America. So because we know that this stuff is all around us, what now? And I wish I could say that this is really warning us about the fact that if we go out into the world, we need to be on guard for some of this stuff. Because you know he's not talking about the saints, right? He's not talking about the atmosphere inside the church, right? Well, wait a minute. Now verse 5. Having a form of godliness but denying its power. You know what that means? They know where to go on Sunday. They know how to dress on Sunday. 
They know how to act on Sunday. They can do the stuff. But it's empty. They have a form of godliness. They know how to play the role. But they don't have the power behind it. They know how to look like a Christian, but they don't have the self-control to hold on to truth when temptation comes. They know the songs of the redeemed, but they don't know, they don't have the power to live the redeemed life. They know the verses, but they don't have the power to live. He that the Son has set free is free indeed. They know what it's supposed to look like, but they don't have the power to hold their feet into a path of righteousness. I have heard it over and over again. Oh, I know. I know. My wife, you look it up on YouTube, preached a wonderful message about knowing and doing. And in times like this where we are surrounded in the world and in the church with things that will unsettle and destroy the absolute truth, we need to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that we don't just look good, but goodness resides in the depths of our heart. Let me read this particular passage, these verses out of the book, out of the message, it kind of gives it that emphasis that hopefully lets it go a little deeper. It says, don't be naive. There are difficult, difficult times ahead. Can you get an amen? I've even, I've even heard individuals talk about how that the younger generation has really got trouble ahead. You realize they were saying that when I was a teenager, right? As the end approaches, people are going to be self-absorbed, money-hungry, self-promoting, stuck-up, profane, contemptuous of parents, crude, coarse, dog-eating dog, unbending, slanderers, impulsively wild, savage, cynical, treacherous, ruthless, bloated windbags. <laughs> Isn't that great? <laughs> Addicted to lust and allergic to God. <laughs> There's an inhaler for that, ad- for that allergy. It's called the spirit of the living God, right? They'll make a show of religion, but behind the scenes, they're animals. And I love this last part. Stay clear of those people. Amen. <laughs> that's, our, that's our challenge from God's word. Jesus said there's going to be things that you put confidence in, like the disciples, the temple, and they're going to be destroyed. You better have your feet on the rock, Christ Jesus. And when it gets tough, don't get worried. Just keep praying. Look towards the end, not for an escape hatch. Don't look for a way out. Look to the one who made it through. Because to him who overcomes, to the one that endures, there will be a reward. Timothy, it's going to get ugly. It's going to get ugly in the world. It's going to get ugly in the church. I am convinced today We do not need more culture, varieties of culture. We need a culture of righteousness. We need a passion for a decency in our relationship with other people. But I'm convinced we don't have a relationship, a decent relationship with God, and therefore it makes it really hard to have a decent relationship with his creation. So now what? Now what? James writes, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. If James were here, 
the brother of Jesus, he would say, you need to be excited about the times we live in. How many of you have, have ran into somebody who's been just all negative about the condition of the world? Have you ever ran this way? Do you realize that when a person gets to that point where they can't see anything good, they need Jesus? Do you realize that some people, until they run out of all the hope that they thought they had, aren't ready for Jesus? Do you realize that Jesus said you are the light of the world and the best way for a candle to be of its potential is for the darkness to abound? And yet, what do we look for? Happy days. What do we look for? Good days. I, have hear, I hear people over the years saying, man, I wish it was back in the good old days. And I always like to challenge people just a little bit when they say that. I say, how far you want to go back? <laughs> Landlines? How far you want to go back? No telephones? Were those the good old days? How about outhouses? That was the good old days, right? <laughs> No. The fact is, this is the day the Lord has made. And yes, it may be getting dark. And yes, there may be conflict and there may be challenges. But the truth is, it's been there all along. Where grace abounds, sin does or where sin abounds, grace does more abounds. In other words, sin has always been there. If you're living in grace, you're riding the wave. If you're not living in God's grace, you're plugging through the mud. But now that the mud seems to be rising in our society, we've got to ask ourselves, what am I standing on? James says, count it all joy. Why? Why? Knowing this, that the testing of your faith produces patience. You know why you're still here? I've had people tell me in the hospital, I told the Lord to tell me. I I told the Lord to take me. I told the Lord, I'm ready. You can come anytime. I don't know why the Lord has me here still. I have a feeling that I've stumbled across a really good answer for that. If you're still here and you're ready to go, it's patience that he's working on. Because patience, when it's had its perfect work, will leave you complete, perfect, and lacking nothing. Isn't that a great ending? Absolutely. He goes on in verse 12 of chapter 1 to say, Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. When you're tempted to say, now what? Remember, God's still sovereign. When you're tempted to say, now what's next? Remember, God still has a plan. Do not be deceived. In verse 16, he says, my my brethren, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Now that we know that we are not living in unbiblical times, now that you know Jesus said this was going to come, now that you know that Paul, under the inspiration of the Spirit, wrote to Timothy about tough times, and now that you know James said, hey, your attitude in tough times needs to be one that allows God to have His complete work and not rest it on the shoulders of other human beings. I want to leave you with three things that you need to focus on in times like this. 
Now that we here at Cornerstone have walked through the first fruits, now that we've walked through what, what Jesus did and how we're going to implement these things into our lives and giving you a challenge to start the routine, three things. And if, you've got, if you're a note taker, I'd like you to write these three things. If you're not a note taker, I'd like you to write these three things down. Because I believe they are biblical. I believe they will be beneficial to allowing you to live just like Jesus. Number one, in times like this, be faithful. In times like this, faithfulness has got to settle us when everything else seems to be falling apart. Jesus said in John chapter 15, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot be, bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Jesus was challenging his disciples before he left to stay connected, stay put. At our house, we've got several trees. One of those trees has a rope tied to the branch. At the end of that rope is a tire. We call it a tire swing. And you know what? We've been there almost five years. And I have yet to walk out and see that branch that 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 tire swing is hanging on, all of a sudden, move. All of a sudden, relocate. It stays put. It has faithfully stayed put in that tree, and as a result, any time, every time my girls want to go out and swing, it's there. That's faithfulness. When God puts you somewhere, stay put. When God plants you, stay planted. In times like this, stay put. Now, that doesn't mean God can't say, hey, you're going to go to uh, North Africa. That doesn't mean that God can't say, hey, I'm going to send you to California. I'm going to send you to New York. But what I'm talking about faithfulness, I'm talking about faithfulness in God. Faithfulness in God's word faithfulness to the reading of God's word, faithfulness to prayer, faithfulness to fasting, faithfulness to fellowship, faithfulness to these six things that we've talked about in this first part of the year. Stay faithful. Why? Because that's how you will become fruitful. That's the next word I want you to write down. Fruitful. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For those of you that like the Greek, the Greek word for abide is meno. It's a word that means to stay in a state of mind, in a state of relationship, in a state of expectancy. If you are faithfully attaching yourself to Christ, guess what? You can constantly look to a better day. But when your foundation is not solid in Jesus Christ, you will be tempted to look to the left and look to the right. And Jesus said, the person who's plowing and looks back, not a good plow guy. I remember driver's ed. How many of you took driver's ed? You remember driver's ed? I remember driver's ed back in Montana when you could drive as fast as you wanted to on the interstate. But just because you could didn't mean you should, especially if you were 14 and the teacher was right beside you. But I remember with my wheels and my 10 and 2, right? 10 and 2, there we go. And I was driving, and, and, and I was doing this. And as a result, what the car do? Pretty soon, the driver's ed teacher wisely said, Hey, Michael, look a little farther down the road. And if you look a little farther down the road, you won't move as much. I wonder if in times like this, we need to look a little farther down the road. We get caught up in the stuff that seems to be so attractive and discouraging and frustrating. And ultimately, we're going like this, aren't we? 
Oh, did you see what he said? Oh, look over here what he said. Did you read this? Yeah, but did you read this? But when I read this, I look a little further down the road. It's not that I don't know what's going on. It's not that I'm not aware of what's going on. It's the fact that that's not where I'm headed. The reality of our world today is there's a lot of things vying for your attention, your money, your talents, your time. But ultimately, the things of this world are going to fade. And only what Jesus provides will stay Psalms 1, we read it. A faithfulness to not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Faithfulness that keeps us out of the path of sinners. A faithfulness to God's word that keeps us out of the seat of the scornful. That's the kind of faithfulness I'm talking about. As I said, that faithfulness will lead us to fruitfulness. Jesus said it, if you abide in me, you will bear much fruit. That's the ultimate goal, folks. The ultimate goal is not for you to just eat, live, and die. You were created for more than that. You were created for more than just to be self-absorbed with selfishness. You were created to produce. And I was raised in a home where my parents told me, that the definition of maturity is when you start to give more than you take. More blessed to give than to receive, Jesus said. It's also a sign of your maturity. And when I'm talking about fruitfulness, I'm talking about Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, which says the, word, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, Peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. I wonder what kind of a world we would live in if that was the fruit that we desired above all. The fruit of the Spirit. The last thing I'd like you to write down if you're writing down is the word fireworks. Faithfulness. Fruitfulness and fireworks. I am convinced that now that we have completed the first fruits, now that our country has completed several things like the election and some of the other things that are on the horizon, we can begin to anticipate the fireworks. In some circles, the fireworks has already started. But what about the Christian? What about those who are faithfully grounding themselves in God's Word? What about those who are producing the fruit of the Spirit in their lives? I would like you to be reminded today there are great things in store for the faithful and the fruitful. There are awesome things in store for those who stick to the path of righteousness There are incredible things that God has planned for you in 2017, but it requires that you be faithful and it requires that you be fruitful because if you ever decide to give up on God, you may miss the fireworks. I want you to think about Daniel. Daniel chapter 11, verse 32 Records, but the people who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. Was it always easy for Daniel? Was it easy as a young boy when he left his homeland to go to a strange land? Was it easy when he had to make a choice about what he was going to eat and what he wasn't going to eat? Was it easy when he was put up to, to, to die with the rest of them and had to stand up and say, give me just a little bit more time? Was it easy when as a leader who was promoted began to get talked about, began to get undermined? Was it easy as he looked into the face of the lions? No, but we have those stories today of Daniel and the greatness of his God because he was faithful, because he was fruitful. And when the fireworks came, glory be to God. Amen. Amen.
You take a look at the life of Joseph. Was it easy when his brothers betrayed him? No. Hated him, made fun of him? No. Was it easy when you realized they really meant they were going to kill him when they threw him in the well? No. Was it easy as he walked off hearing the jingle of money that had just been paid and his freedom, his future was slavery? Was it easy when his master's wife betrayed him? He stood for what was right and ended up in jail. Was it easy when he was forgotten after he helped two other guys out? No. But because he was faithful and because he was fruitful, when the time came and the firework display went off and he's sitting second command in all of Egypt, you better believe he was excited about what God was doing in his life. Amen. The disciples, Jesus, when is all this going to happen and you come back? And Jesus goes into this long discussion about how things are going to get horrible and worse. Is it going to be easy when there's rumors of wars and wars going all around you? No. Is it going to be easy when you got this guy saying he's Jesus, another guy saying he's Jesus? No. Is it going to be easy when people betray you in your own house? No. But if you're faithful and if you're fruitful, when the time comes and he hear, when we hear the trumpet sound and we're all raising up, it will be worth it. So what did the disciples do? They stayed faithful. Did they falter? Oh yeah, read the rest of the Gospels. You'll see they doubted. You'll see they denied him. You'll see they rejected him. You'll see all these kind of things. But when it was all said and done on the day of Pentecost, when the fireworks show took off, there was 12 disciples and 120 total, and they got to experience the fire of the Holy Spirit, and it set off something that is still rippling around the world today. I can't tell you when your fireworks show is going to be. But I can tell you this. It'll be worth the wait. I can't tell you when Jesus is coming back. But I can tell you it'll be worth the wait for those who are faithful and fruitful. Now what do we need? We will ultimately need the power of God's Spirit. Why? Because that's what keeps us faithful. The power of God's Spirit keeps us fruitful. If the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, it'll quicken your mortal body. For what? To produce fruit. We need His amazing grace. 